The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or afternoon, uh, wherever you may be joining us from today. Uh, thank you for taking your time out of the day today to join us for our monthly technical webinar series. Uh, we're going to be doing a webinar on risk, apply, and win. Our presenters today are Tom Poland. He's the Director of uh, Solutions Architect for Dell Tech. And we also have Daryl Townsend. He's one of our Senior Project Controls Consultants here at DR McNaddy. Before we get started, I got a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to go over first and foremost. Uh, all call-in lines are muted, and that is in order to preserve the quality of the audio for all of our attendees as we are recording this webinar. If at any time you have any questions during our session, there is a questions box. You can submit those questions, and time permitting, we'll try to answer as many, if not all, as possible. And for most people that are on here, we have some people that uh, things come up that can't show up. We will be providing a follow-up email. And that follow-up to all of our registrants and attendees, we will provide a copy of the presentation today, a link to the recording of today's webinar, if you'd like to share that with any of your colleagues or clients. And we will also put together a questions and answers submission because we will get questions probably offline as well too. We're going to get started with our presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Tom Poland from Dell Tech. Hi, Dan. Thanks. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Daryl, uh, for, uh, for agreeing to, to come on board with us today and, and join the fun. Uh, Daryl, um, I particularly enjoy presenting uh, with you because we have great conversations, and that's what we're, uh, that's what we're doing today. Um, as Dan said, I'm Tom Poland, Solutions Architect. I talk a lot about the Acumen software and risk management. We're going to be doing some risk management today. Uh, hey, Daryl, why don't you introduce yourself real quick, and uh, and we'll get down into it. Yeah, Daryl Townsend here with uh, DR McNatty. Uh, I also do a lot of uh, risk presentations and do a good number of demos for on behalf of Dell Tech, both in the Acumen uh, Fuse as well as the Risk Suite. Um, so just happy to share a little bit of the tool um, and hear, hear a little bit, maybe some new tricks and tricks of uh, Tom's. Thanks, Tom. Cool. All right. Let me advance my slide here. And Daryl, you're seeing where it says today on top of the slide and what we're doing? Yes. Okay, brilliant. That's all working. Um, we're going to do some role playing today. And uh, we'll, I won't give it all away, but Daryl's uh, going to be the program manager. I'm going to be the risk a analyst. And we're going to take you through the opposite of the pitfalls that we've seen before. We're going to call those out in a few minutes. Daryl and I are going to share our experiences on how we've seen risk done in the past and maybe how we did risk before we were quite as experienced as we are now, if you catch my drift. In other words, um, don't feel bad if when we list the pitfalls, if you're doing some of those today, because we all have. And then we'll be showing you what we feel is a much better, more team involved and accurate way to forecast risk. So we're going to talk about those pitfalls. We're going to talk about why do this. And it's not just because your customer tells you that you need to. That's not a great answer. That's an okay answer, but that's not a great answer. We're going to talk about the pitfalls of, of non-collaboration. In fact, when you see Daryl and I collaborate and go back and forth and maybe even disagree with each other at certain points in time, you'll see that the collaboration is necessary. Otherwise, working in a vacuum. And then, you, so you've got a risk-adjusted forecast. So it's telling you you're going to be six or eight months late. Well, what do you do about it? So what? Do you report that? Do you hide that? Or do you do what we're going to do today? Do you try to optimize it, get it back on track? Um, before we get into it, uh, I want to talk to you about what we call the S1 to S5 project maturity framework. This started at Dell Tech, but we've been doing our best to infect the industry with it. This is tool independent. Daryl can attest to that. Uh, this is not this maturity framework. It is the guiding light for many of the Dell Tech tools for the sort of consulting, Daryl, and that you do at, at DR McNatty and other consultants perform. S1, let me get right into it. S1 is the base. This is the project plan that you may already be building today, 
uh, with the likes of Dell Tech Open Plan, Primavera P6, Microsoft Project, and some others as well. Um, our Dell Tech platform for risk assessment that we'll be talking about today is scheduling tool independent, scheduling tool agnostic. You bring what you've got from the tool that you're using. Now, S2, we won't do much of this today. We might get a warning about this when we do risk. This is critiquing the schedule. This is making sure that it's linked and linked properly, that it's not over relying on things like hard constraints, leads and lag. We want smooth flowing logic. We want the fundamentals of CPM driving the schedule. Not all those funny buttons and pull downs that you can use when you sometimes need to. We don't want to see a project schedule infected with those. We want to see smooth flowing quality schedule logic leading to the key milestones in the project. Now S3 is where we're squarely focused today, risk adjusting the schedule. So when we take on our roles in a few moments with Daryl as the program manager, we're gonna take the agreed upon schedule and we're gonna start introducing risk and uncertainty into the equation. That's where you're gonna see a lot of discussion between Daryl and I today, because there might be some negotiation or collaboration when it comes to risk adjusting the schedule and setting the parameters. Now S4 is about optimization. If we've got time today, we're actually gonna get into this as well, because I can guarantee you that Daryl and I, when we bring realism through S3 to the schedule, it's going to delay the schedule, so we're going to need to optimize it. S5, you're gonna see me put some different charts and reports up on the screen today. They're not for my benefit, some of them are, but some of them are for getting the entire team at large involved in the exercise and portraying the information in a language they can understand, even if they're not an expert in risk. They should be an expert in the project and understand risk. If they're an expert in the science of risk management, that might be good, but that might not help program execution. So we want to take the information related to risk and put it in a digestible format for those who aren't nearly as excited about risk as all of us. Daryl, I'm gonna ask for your comments in a moment here. Um, old school project risk reviews. You could call this, how would you used to do it? and how many still do it today. And that's okay. We're just gonna show you some better ways today. So here's what I used to do, Daryl. I used to create a risk register in Excel. It was independent from the project plan. We would take the probability assigned to each risk, multiply it by a dollarized risk exposure, add them up at the bottom of the screen and go home, call it a day, send it to the customer, and they'd, they'd pat us on the head. And we would never look at it again. Risks would come up, but they were actions. They were ad hoc events. They were fire drills to address those, those risks. Six months into project execution, that original risk register was so out of date. If I put it up on the screen, people would have laughed at me and said, Tom, you're not keeping up with the events of the project. Daryl, over to you for a few moments. How about you? Have you seen some of these characteristics or even participated in some of these characteristics of old school project risk reviews? Uh, I have seen, participated, and actually led some of these nice project <laughs> risk reviews. Thanks for the, your honesty. <laughs> go on, go on. Yeah, so uh, typical in some of the large organizations I've been associated with, uh, it, typically was a one-time exercise, or if not a one-time exercise, maybe you did it twice over the project life. Um, in, in, in both of those cases that come right to my mind are, were checking the box exercises. They weren't intended to actually provide any valuable feedback either to the team or to management. They were more uh, of, of going through the, the gate if you will, and making sure that you did everything you were supposed to do to say that, yes, I'm ready for the next phase of the project. Um, and and okay. they were... You've got, go ahead. You faded out for a second there. Sorry, you go, you go ahead. You faded, faded out for a second. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I was checking the box, right? I mean, that's what we've, we've, okay. we've historically jumped into. Um, and in, in some cases, we're, um, as mentioned there in the next bullet, we're building or reviewing a schedule that may or may not be what the project is actually being driven by. Um, it might have been built um, six months ago, um, and that's what we're reviewing, when in reality the project is taking on a different life altogether, maybe different scope. Uh, maybe it's changed out project management team. Uh, 
Um, okay, so the right exercise on the wrong project plan is the wrong exercise. Right. You risk, you potentially risk adjusted A schedule, but it was out of date. Right. And again, you're just checking the box in order to say, yeah, we did it. Uh, let's move on to the to the real to the real work, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's pressure from your internal process. If you've got these stage gates and it says you do a risk review, you do a risk review. That's part of your job. But it doesn't mean that you necessarily did a relevant risk review, which is helping you forecast the project. I had customer pressure in the defense industry to do a risk review. Well, and, and as I mentioned, the risk review started out with a risk register, but then there was the weekly risk and actions call, which was waiting for problems to happen and then solving them after they happen. That's not forecasting. That's the opposite of it. I've also the been, rear mirror instead of the yeah, yeah. I've also been in, involved, as you mentioned uh, briefly, Tom, in the exercise of reviewing. In, in, in one particular case, I can remember us reviewing the risk register on a regular basis um, to to actually keep it current. But the problem with that exercise actually was specifically the risk register was just a, basically a, it wasn't a static document, but that information was never plowed back into the actual risk um, model itself and actually re-ran. It was just basically a, a standalone document, an Excel spreadsheet, if you will, uh, to keep up with the risk, but they never were reapplied back into the model to actually understand whether or not you're doing better or worse than we were when we actually did the risk exercise itself. Well, that's a great point. You've got a risk register that says you got six months worth of very likely schedule delay and $5 million worth of cost overrun, and your integrated master schedule fully status shows that you're on track and on cost. And then someone has subconsciously decided that all that risk is going to get itself worked out by the end of the project. I've worked on a lot of projects, though, that have finished late and over budget. Or, hope, or, or, or at least hope that they're reassigned before that, that risk cup pops up on their, on their radar, right? There's an art to being on a project for a fairly short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, um, okay, all right. Let's uh, let's get into it here. Let's get into our role today, Daryl. Why don't you introduce the new role that you're taking on for the next forty minutes or so? Sure. So today I'm actually going to be the project manager. Um, I've given Tom a a detailed project plan, and I expect him to run a risk analysis on that plan. Um, I'm using all the current tools uh, in P6, and and I want to I want to actually run this risk analysis myself, eh, whether or not at this point my client asks for that exercise to be done or not, because I want to actually have some um, information in my back pocket when and if that question pops up about whether or not I had run this analysis before he actually tells me to run this analysis. Cool, cool. Thanks. And th this is me over here, the program analyst. Um, I like most of what Daryl is saying. Now, one thing that, that kind of stuck out in my mind that he said is he said he wants me to run a risk analysis. And I'll be letting him know pretty quickly in the exercise that we are running a risk analysis. And I'm just clicking some buttons in a very easy to use, very visual piece of uh, of software, but we agree on many things. And very quickly into the exercise, I'm confident I'm going to have Daryl um, agreeing uh, with this approach. Um, so uh, we don't have all the engineers on today, but Daryl works with them in real time, 24/7. So he's going to be able to be accountable for a lot of their answers. Um, I'm going to be given some. I'm very likely going to be giving uh, Daryl some bad news about the risk forecast today, but I'm also going to express to him and show him some ways that that's not necessarily the final answer. And uh, I'm also going to make sure um, that I keep Daryl's calendar not full, but frequently, but frequent touch points, lean touch points for this risk exercise because we can't do what we just can't, what we just talked about. We can't do it at the baseline and then just forget about it. Every time we status the schedule, we should be revisiting risk. And because we're doing it frequently, it won't take very long each time. Now, some of the things that we both, oh, sorry about that. 
Uh, some of the things that we both ag agree on is a plan that's not risk adjusted is not a plan. We know we both know that risk needs to be um, an input. Um, needs to be a team effort. We talked about that. I need consensus from the engineers. Uh, Daryl stayed up all night last night getting that consensus from the engineering team so that he can represent that today. Um, if we do this with the same frequency and rigor that we update the schedule, it's an unbreakable habit. It becomes just something we do as we as we work the project. And then the, um, oh, there I go again, sorry. Uh, the risk and confidence, will be, confidence, assessment, confidence assessment will be frequent. We hit that, we discussed that. Um, Daryl's approach is to do this whether or not the customer is looking. So when the customer is looking, it should be very easy to answer the mail because we already mailed it. We're already doing it. It's just it, just as if they were asking us if we were statusing and updating the schedule and keeping it current just with starts and finishes. The answer is yes on that. And we want the answer to be yes. Our risk register was updated this morning. We mapped additional risks to activities just yesterday in an engineering meeting. It doesn't have to be a separate discipline from handling the project plan as we always do. Every project threat and opportunity is open for discussion. Does it mean they're all gonna end up on the risk register? We don't need those one in a million risks on there. We need those one in 10 risks on there, but all are open for discussion. If we do this right, we know the delays, we fully scope the delays before they happen and can take action now. Maybe even if it means spending a little bit of money now to make sure that we don't end up with a big problem later on. So keep some of these things in mind. I'll put that first slide back up, keep some of these things in mind, the consensus, risk adjusting it, as we show you the software, because there's a real key here, the hidden truth to this. These, uh, what is it, eight bullets, seven bullets here, these look great. We could teach a class just on these seven bullets and why they're important. But if they're difficult to operationalize, if, you, if it's difficult, if it takes 10 times as long to keep the risk model update to date as it does to status the schedule, no one's going to do it. So not only do we need, I need Daryl and the team to buy into it, I need to demonstrate to them that as quickly as they're telling me the information, I'm putting, into the, I'm putting it into the software and giving them some results back. Otherwise, it's a terribly inefficient exercise and we'll keep putting it off until inevitably the project ends late. So Daryl, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. Well, here's what I've done to prepare for the exercise. Very little, actually. I spent about five seconds importing our initial plan into Acumen. Oh, and let me go full screen here. Daryl, just, just let me know in a minute if, uh, if, if Acumen kind of expands to fill the, uh, the sharing window yeah, there. You're there. Okay. And now what I'm going to do, now we can look at the schedule here, but we've looked at it already. We built it. We refined it. We fixed some, not all of the problems. We might get some warnings on some remaining problems from Acumen. But let's go over to S3 Risk. And let me tell you, Daryl, what I need from you today. I hope you're ready. I hope you talk to all those engineers. And what I need from you is actually pretty lean. I got the schedule open here. I'm in the S3 risk tab in Acumen. So we're definitely focused on risk. Now this isn't the whole schedule. I've got it collapsed. So it is the whole schedule, but visually, I wanna keep this very lean for right now because I know we've got seven or eight WBS areas and each of those WBS areas is seven or eight children and some of those children have children and it gets, it gets pretty detailed when it comes down to it. Here's what I'm not gonna do, Daryl. I'm not going to ask you for three point estimates on every single activity in this project. You and the engineers have other things to do. And I know, I know you guys are all for getting this project done and risk adjusted, but if we try to do three new durations on every single activity here, someone's getting bored. And if it's not you, it's going to be me. So we've got to keep this interesting, engaged, and simple. So what I'm going to do, Daryl, is we're going to run down these WBS areas. And I don't want you to overthink it. I want you to tell me red, yellow, green regarding your confidence in the duration. And really what I wanna do also, because I don't know, I'm not the technical expert. I don't know how technical this project is. 
compared to all, all the ones that we've done before. I want you to give me a read on the whole project and your confidence in what we have in there as, as the baseline, and then give me a read on any exceptions to the level two. So my okay. first question is, how do you feel about this project? Is this something we've done before, or are we in a heavy experimental or research and development mode? This would probably be the second time we've done this project. So we have some experience, but we're not, it's not to a point to where I could repeat it over and over again. I okay. agree with that. Now, right. let, me, let me stop okay. you, Tom. So you're actually yeah. doing um, this risk exercise on the actual schedule that I sent you. You're not remanufacturing or building some summary level schedule and doing it on a shorter number of activities. You're actually using it on the entire plan that I've given you. Correct. You know, with the software that I used to use from a different vendor, it didn't have the capacity to accept fully resource loaded, fully built out project plans. It didn't even accept all the different relationship and constraint types. So not only did I need to summarize it, is I needed to kind of dumb down some of my scheduling techniques. Here with Acumen Risk, Acumen Risk to the rescue, here with Acumen Risk, I can bring in my fully detailed project plan. The way that I'm simplifying it so that you and I don't have to be on the phone all day is I'm taking advantage of the WBS that's there to make a virtual summary schedule where we can talk about the high points and then only drill in where we feel like we need to. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. So right now, you told me, yeah, we've done it before. So we've got some data and data is good. So I set light red for the whole project. I could have made a case to set red based on what Daryl told me, but I set light red. That set the whole rest of the project for now to light red. We just did a high level risk assessment on the entire project and could start producing data, but I'm going to want some more detail. And, and, so and Daryl's got the time and the knowledge. We'll go into it. And what parameters are being applied based on the color selection that you've chosen. Gotcha. Now, in, in real, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that, Daryl. If this was a room full of engineers, I would have said, I'll tell you later because I don't want any debates breaking out. Be, and, and here's those parameters. And the reason why I don't want any, any debates breaking out is one thing that I'm known to do and arguably notorious for doing is going to the most likely unrealistic and changing it to how early or late we delivered on the first incarnation of this project. You said we did it once before. That's my clue to go to the historical information from the first project and see if we finished on time. If we didn't, if we finished 7% late, I'm gonna type 107 right here. So when you set yellow and you say it's down the middle, it's actually gonna lean it 7% to the right. It's a little bit of psychology. Now, Daryl, I like you, I respect you. I'm not gonna play games with you today. And I'm gonna leave it right down the middle. We'll say that that historical project worked out pretty well. But we may have decided I left these at the software default, so that's what I want everybody to see today. But we may have decided to tweak some of these parameters based on historical information. Yes. <clears throat> another thing, another thing, uh, an aside, I guess, to this template here is that, and I've, I've been burned by this a few times in the slider exercise, is that I have to be conscious of the really long duration activities that might be included in my schedule. Because if I apply very aggressive slider point to one of those really long durations, it may push that particular activity or WBS element to a completely impossible duration to ever anybody would ever see. So I, I'm conscious of these ranges as I'm applying the sliders. And I may go back and look at really long duration activities to make sure that what I've applied is still something that's, that's, even though it's going to be a maximum duration, it's still within still within the world that, that we're we're playing in. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if if this were a little less research and development and a little more high rate production, we might do something like this, where I've shaved these values a little bit, and maybe. If we don't hit too many home runs, but we're good with, uh, you know, singles and doubles and stolen bases in terms of execution, you know, maybe this is 75, 85, 
95. You can come up with different templates for different types of work and invoke them when you need to with these open and safe commands. So when you take the time to tailor a template, you can, you can retain that for future use. I'm going to hit cancel. I'm going to leave those the way they were at the default. I, I want people to see today how this software works straight out of the box. Okay, now, Daryl, I've got to, I've got to ask you, I'm sure there's some exceptions to our light red. I'm sure we're better at some of these and more repeatable on some of these disciplines um, than others. Do you have some suggestions on where we might want to adjust some of these sliders? So this being the second time, we have some historical knowledge now um, from the engineering side, but at the same time now, knowing what we know, we want to make some changes on the engineering side based on those lessons learned, if you will. So I expect that some of my early design could actually take longer um, because of that. I'm hoping actually, because this is number two, to actually be able to decrease the amount of time actually in detailed design. Okay. So you think there's still a little learning curve on detailed on early design, but detailed design, maybe we can put down the middle based on additional experience correct now we did make some procure okay. we did make some procurement changes um since the last design since the last install of this um and so i expect the procurement items um at least for um the initial long leads is going to be longer for sure okay and, and the reason i expanded procurement is there's a real cross section in, in here of things that we're procuring versus relying on vendor A and vendor B. So I used my my analyst mind to say, well, procurement kind of, you know, it represents a few different approaches, internal and external buy versus make, et cetera. So I expanded that out so that Daryl would have the opportunity to review the different vendors involved and, you know, initial versus secondary long lead items, just to make sure I wasn't summarizing too much. And then in my construction side, um, the construction side of things, I'm pretty confident, although um, the mechanical last time bit us bad, and I suspect it's going to take us longer this time as well. Okay, so we've got that set to run. You faded a little bit there, but I think I heard you say mechanical could still be a sticking point. Correct. It will be. Okay. And okay. then on the, on the commissioning side, we have um, always had issues mostly with uh, resource constraints, finding just the right people to do the commissioning. Um, so I suspect the internal pre-comms activity is going to take longer. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll set. We have time as we learn through the project. That's late in the project. So I'll make you a deal. You're making me uncomfortable, so I'll set red for now. But let's make sure we revisit this uh, along with the others every update just to see if we're comfortable making any changes at some point in time. <clears throat> now, Tom, I have to ask a question now. We haven't gotten to the risk side of things. We're only dealing with duration uncertainty at this time. But should I be considering in my uncertainty ranges – should I be thinking in terms of risk or should I be thinking only in terms of uncertainty for the activities? You're free to think of both. However, once we start talking about the risk register, and I've got the one here ready from Excel to import. Once we start talking risk register, I want to make sure that we don't double dip. And, and what I mean by that is if we set early design to red, and then we also identified a discrete risk for the same reason, I'll probably move this slider back to yellow because I don't want to move the slider to red and then also map in something from, from the risk register. In fact, a very wise man uh, says the sliders are for the general variability, the general duration uncertainty, just general behaviors of the business, whereas the risk register will be a specific event that will know at a given time whether or not whether or not it's occurred. And if that makes sense to you, Mr. Program Manager, 
I will open that risk register from Excel. The reason I had it in Excel is because I circulated it to the team in Excel because that's a tool that they have. And then they made their modifications and I brought it back into Acumen, which is the tool that I use to manage the risk register. Oh, seeing well, you, pretty, seeing you import the Excel uh, for the risk register reminded me that there is a function inside uh, risk that I could actually export out the uncertainty ranges of the activities as well. Yes, yes, yes. It is right there. And then if people make changes to that activity uncertainty in Excel, I can import it back. So we can do this live and my preference, my overwhelming preference is to do this live. But if it's just not possible, we can literally distribute an Excel document to folks. They can fill it out and they can send it back to me. I've also been on projects where um, in P6 they used user-defined fields to populate the uncertainty ranges. And then I've used that information to populate that uncertainty range as well. Yep, yep, you map those in on the fields tab. So if someone has taken the effort to put in those three-point estimates, you can bring them in directly. Now, here's what happens culturally once people start using this software is, and, and I'll reveal a little bit here, we're creating three-point estimates as we were moving the sliders based on those mathematical factors that we had up on the screen earlier. Once people start using the sliders, they rarely go back to Excel or, or go in here, and you can actually manually type them in here. Because actually, when I had first set the slider for the project to light red, it populated three-point estimates at that light red level throughout the entire project. I did more typing in a split second than I could do in an hour from moving the slider. Then when we were going through and, and tweaking, it was then adjusting the three-point estimates down at those lower levels. We did a tremendous amount of typing together without touching the keyboard. And, and this is a simplified version, but you can imagine a a schedule that might be 10,000, 20,000 activities that I typically do this for on a monthly basis. Yeah, yeah, and what I look for is a solid level two, level three WBS. Beneath that, it gets kind of you know noisy, you know, if, if children have children, have children, have children, but levels two and three really seem to be the sweet spot for setting those sliders. So I'll qualify a schedule for risk based both on schedule quality and the strength and integrity of the WBS breakdowns themselves. And as you described before, Tom, especially in the event that you're actually doing this exercise with either the whole project team or a portion of the project team, um, and if you had to imagine going through 5,000 active or even 200 activities one by one, applying a min, most likely a maximum duration to it. Uh, I think the room would get pretty thin about 30 minutes into it and everybody's phones would be ringing on why they needed to leave the room. Yeah, yeah, 200 activities, small schedule, 200 activities, each with their own duration. And then you're going to add 600 more durations, 200 times three a minimum, most likely, and maximum duration for each one of those 200 activities, in addition to the duration, the deterministic or original duration that they already gave you. So if you stand up in a room, try this, everybody should try this, stand in front of a room with a project team with a 200 line schedule open, leave all the duration generic and at five days and say, I'm go we're going to put down 800 numbers in this schedule. People will be out of that room so quick you won't even know what happened. Lunch, what won't, lunch did, won't keep them in the room. <laughs> lunch won't keep them in the room, exactly. So what, what you and I did is we moved only about seven or eight of the sliders, and the whole time we actually had those numbers in for the whole project, they were put in automatically by the slider setting. Yes, they can be tweaked. You're not bound to the sliders. You can go over and change those numbers, but what a heck of a starting point, and in most cases, that's the finishing point as well for the duration uncertainty. And as an analyst, I'm comfortable using this software in front of a people 
front of a room of people watching me use this software. I don't use scheduling software in front of people because everybody's an expert and tells me, oh, you missed the predecessor. You did this. How come you're doing it in that order? And I hate it. It gives me a headache. And I'm just like, I just want to fold up my laptop and run out to the parking lot. You know, <laughs> when people are trying to drive <laughs> my computer verbally from the middle of the room with the sliders, that's just pain free. It's, you know, we might debate where, where the sliders should be set. And that's good. That's actually us collaborating but it's not people telling me how to use the software because it's so easy to use. There's no way to, there's no other way to do it. So let's talk about the risk register, but this, this thing that we pulled in from Excel with these named events that can and maybe will go wrong. Now, the first thing is, is when Daryl, me and the team put the risk register together, I didn't ask them for percentages and dates. I asked them to use English, use their words. Is it a medium risk? Is it a high risk? And they they might say, oh, how you know what's the probability of a high risk? And I say, D don't worry, don't worry about the probability assigned to it. That is right here if they want to see it. But I don't want people backing into the numbers. If they have a high risk that has a high probability, I don't want them trying to be conservative. I want them being as honest as possible. And the way we do that here is I say, listen, just tell me high, medium, and low. We'll worry about the percentages and such and the math later on. I just want an honest shot at it. If there's some subjectivity, bring the subjectivity to the table and tell me why. It doesn't have to be a lock you down to a number type exercise. The same thing with the impacts. We have days behind them. You could do those in percentages as well. But just tell me high, medium, low. We'll work out the rest. And if we need, if we need to tweak something later on because something was more severe than it ever could be, we'll take care of that by re-rating it right here on the risk register. It's really quite simple. In fact, this risk register on the right-hand side, it not only came from Excel, but when we originally developed it in Acumen, it's a lot, it, it works just like an Excel spreadsheet with some pull-downs in it, which you can also do in Excel. There's no, you know, you type in the name of the risk. There's, um, there's threats and opportunities and there's, and there's weather events. There's nothing complicated about entering the risk. And the next thing I'm gonna ask you to do, Daryl, is, I want you to pick some WBS areas, consider the risk register over the right, over to the right, and tell me where you think there might be an intersection between the two. So if we would have a manufacturing delay due to you know, risk 10, I want that information so that I can actually use this mapping column to map those risks in to the schedule. You catch my drift? Yes. Yeah, so definitely, uh, as you brought up risk 10, um, Heavy lift vessel. Um, yeah, there is a item underneath construction that uh, should be tied, I believe. Um, or is it underneath manufacturing? I can't remember now. Yeah, we have domestic offshore. and offshore manufacturing. Offshore. Oh, offshore, there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Would now would the vessel apply to all of offshore, or are there particular phases in offshore that it would apply to? Let's just apply them at this point. Let's apply them to all because there is some movement over which activities might be in which phase. Okay, folks, watch this. This is how quick this happens. I click on offshore. I click on risk ten where it says map. Now the relationship has been set. And let, at this point, unless Daryl wants to have more discussion on it, I'm actually just ready to go on to the next one. It's that quick. Daryl, you got some more? Yeah, I'm scanning through. It looks like several of them are related to uh, resource restrictions, whether or not they be uh, labor availability or um, yeah, risk, risk 11. Risk 11. Risk 34. 34. And then there's another one down there. Uh, approval of visas. Higher craft in 42. Looks like a number of those are related to um, resource issues, which are most, most of them are going to occur during the construction phase. Okay. So let's head down to construction. And what I'm going to do, just based on what he said, 
I'm going to map in 11, 34, 42, and 41. 41. Now, what Daryl might do, and I'm going to do that very impulsively in front of him, and he's going to like, he's going to get hesitant. He's going to be like, oh my gosh, is this going to open a can of worms or what? And what if he tells me, hey, listen, foundation's not an issue for any of those, I can opt those mappings out of foundation. So what we did to save time is we mapped everything to construction instead of going to each individual construction activity and saying, we map them here and then I would click four times because <laughs> I mapped in four risks and then we would go to mechanical and I would map them four times. I map them four times to the parent and then I can just go in by exception and unmap the ones where they wouldn't apply. Just time saving. You could do it the long way. You could do it building them up one by one. But I'm pretty impulsive. I'll just map them all in and then I'll say, hey, Daryl, tell me where they don't apply. And it's quicker. I sure like that uh, risk of having uh, pirates during FPSO sail away. Um, that's a cool risk, huh? That is. Anytime, well, you know what? Pirates aren't cool, Daryl. That's not oh, funny. That's a oh. real. That's a real issue in international shipping. Shame on you. <laughs> I tell you what is. Now I haven't worked on this project before, but I am a program control resource on a lot of different projects at this company. And there's one thing that I know about our procurement is they tend to be international endeavors, and there's a risk called risk of customs delays. It has a schedule and a cost impact because there's a cost of not having the material. And in some countries, we've got to pay a little bit to get things through customs a little bit quicker. What are you saying there, Tom? <laughs> I'm not implying anything. I'm not implying anything. Um, you, can, you may infer some things, but I'm not making any implications. Um, I've also worked in environments, true story, where we had to get titanium in from the right countries um, because of embargoes and such. So we might have had to ship it a few different places before it actually shipped to us. Whether or not you're supposed to do that, I'm not sure, but it was more expensive from a shipping standpoint because we knew we wouldn't clear customs in certain environments. Um, okay. I am going to go ahead and run the risk analysis. And I'm going to brief you. Oops, I had to move something here. I'm going to brief you live and then i'm also going to show you the document that you're going to see in your email by the time you get back to your desk i know you're excited about that by the way acumen is telling us that we have too many lags in our schedule uh -oh. to have a we might have a potentially unreliable risk exercise due to the excessive number of lags in real life i go over here and i view schedule quality and we fix it before i show you any risk results in the magic of a one-hour webinar, I click ignore, and we go ahead and we run the risk analysis anyway. So tell me, tell me about the risk, Tom, and, or, or not the risk, the lags, and the, the reason for the lags being so important in this exercise. Yeah, here's why it's warning us. The activity durations have sliders. They have risks mapped to them. They have variability. We're trying to make them more predictable by bringing risk into the equation. To this point, the five day, the 10 day, and the 30 day lag, to this point, the assumption is, is what we estimated those perfectly. So we accepted that we didn't estimate our durations perfectly, but oh, those lags, by leaving them in the schedule, we're saying we know exactly what they are. There's actually a provision in the Acumen software to convert the lags to activities, and that warning would be my reminder to go back and do that. I'm going to save about 18 seconds right now by not going and doing that <laughs> so that we make sure that we finish on time today. Sure. Which um, we have life, 15, absolutely. which we have 15 minutes for Tom. Exactly. So every 18 seconds counts. So um, Daryl, this is interesting um, because there's three risks jockeying for the number one spot. Oh, and there's a feature that I actually just learned about. Okay. Look at Daryl, you. I didn't realize I could do. I, I didn't realize I could do this to the till literally the other day. You can add uncertainty impact alongside the threat, the risks. Do that again. I didn't see that myself. You were pretty fast there. 
configuration yeah. display logic slash uncertainty bars. Ah, that's awesome. I didn't know that either. It doesn't come up in the training class. I know that. Yeah. Our software engineers never, and our product management team, they don't sleep. So there's always things like that going into the software. It surprised me the other day when somebody asked me about it. I didn't know it was there. It's great. I should read more of my email. <laughs> so when it says things like release notes and new features. So I'm actually really concerned about the, these risk of inability to hire, risk of required resources. Uh, and then these fab yard constraints kind of came out of nowhere. But these were mapped to a very serious part of the project. And to know what those parts of the project are, you hover your mouse over the different segments so that I can tell you exactly who is feeling so much pain on these risks that they're going to experience delays that will delay the entire project if left unmitigated. However, if you look here, now these three add up to more than the uncertainty, but the uncertainty can't be ignored. In real life, if we had about 20 minutes, we would go through our sliders and make sure that we didn't set some sliders to red for the same reasons as we mapped in these risks. I've got to make sure I don't have any double dipping here or we're all going to lose our minds over the delays on this project, but some of them might be doubled up. It's just a consequence of having the ability to move the sliders and then also having the ability to map risk. I wouldn't trade either one of those capabilities, but I've got to make sure that I use them wisely and diligently. That's on me, that's on you, that's on the team to make sure that we're being selective about where we're assigning the, that risk and uncertainty. Now from there, once we get that worked out, if these top three or four risks are still on top of the list, we're gonna start talking mitigation planning. We're not gonna get deep into that today, but we identified the risks that we need to mitigate or else we're gonna have 29 plus 28 plus 27 plus 17 delays. These are additives plus the 50 from uncertainty if that's real. We've got ourselves a 183 day delay at a P50 confidence level, which is a very aggressive confidence level. If we go to a more conservative, these numbers are actually gonna get bigger. 217 days overall. So we've got a real problem on our hands here, but we've got the information to know that we've got a problem on our hands. Let's, <clears throat> let me show you the document that I'm going to email you. I'm going to take from you a, kit, a list of key milestones that you're under a lot of pressure to deliver on. And in fact, I'm just going to pick two right now. Phase four and project finish. P80, I'll give you top five. I don't want you to, I don't want to lose you to lose all your hair. <laughs> did you see my picture, Tom? <laughs> we did have the picture up earlier. I kind of just slid that, slid that in there. Acumen is running autonomously right now. My hands are off the keyboard. They're waving in the air because what Acumen is doing is it's taking the key risk information from the two milestones that I identified, actually one was an activity phase four, and then the project finish milestone. And when you get back to your desk after this risk workshop, you're going to have a risk executive briefing. It's got some statistical information. If you're not in, into the statistics, I'm going to translate it and say, this is bad. That's zero. That means phase four during our risk exercise never was on time during the simulation. And then I'm going to write under here. I'm going to I'm going to be cute before I said this is bad. This is why. This is the root cause of those delays. It's the initial long lead items, and then the two risks that are pushing the long lead item. Phase four, the items. Phase three, and the items. And these are all interdependent. And then it goes on down. Oh, it goes to the risk-driven tornado. This is what we had up on the software with that new uncertainty feature on top. And then the risks underneath. And there's a write-up. And as an analyst, I like to add to the write-up with my thoughts. Apparently, I'm not creative today. I'm just saying that I like to do it. And then there's a write-up on the project finish. 
also 0% deterministic. This is also bad. <laughs> and I'm going to be creative in there because I, I want people to wonder what I'm going to write next so that they're continually engaged in the report. So I, mean, I am going to say things like this is bad. I'm going to say, but we can correct this. We need to get back together. We need to mitigate. This is proof that we need to mitigate. These are all things that I've written in these reports. I like hey, saying this is bad. Hey, Tom, yeah. we had a question come in. Um, do you have any case studies showing how a completed program schedule compares to predictions using the acumen? We do. We have a white paper on that. I don't have like a PowerPoint slide like all ready to go. Um, but if if that person wants to share their uh, email address with us through your chat window there, um, okay. I can get them that exact uh, information. And then we also have the benchmarking capability in the software, which helps you rate your project against a series of thousands of historical projects as well to help you make some predictions. So we've got two ways to approach that. One's live in the software and one's a white paper slash case study that we put together. Okay, perfect. Um, yep, yeah. and then it, and then it goes on through the through the project finish. So now, Daryl, I know we've got to mitigate risk, but there's one more thing that I want to show you today, which is a way that Acumen can help us understand where some of the opportunities might be to unwind risk. And to do that, I barely have enough time, but I really want to. I really want to talk about that because it's one thing to mitigate risks, and we should be mitigating these risks. And the reason is, I want to show you the extent of the problem here. At an 80% confidence level, these these increments are years over here. So we have a three-year project in just a little bit that's very quickly turning into a four-year project. Some of the risks that we assign some of the, the uncertainties that Daryl brought up are on the tail end of the project. Meaning even if we mitigate those risks, we really won't know until it's almost too late whether that mitigation is truly gonna work. I really, one thing I believe in is risk mitigation and we believe in risk mitigation. The other thing we really enjoy is risk avoidance. Meaning if you need to travel across town during rush hour, you can avoid the risk of delays due to rush hour by leaving early and rearranging some of your earlier work. Acumen knows how to do that, either with some guidance from you, which is preferable, or the way I'm going to use it now, I'm just going to turn Acumen loose on this risk-adjusted schedule and see if we can optimize it towards a finish date that's a lot closer to what we've already committed to. So in other words, I might be, right now, I might be Daryl's worst enemy because I just showed him a version of the project plan that runs nine or 10 months longer. And now I'm going to try to be his best buddy. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to ask for about a 15% recovery. Oops. I'm fighting the go-to webinar window here. Bear with me one moment. Okay, there we go. So I asked for about a 15% recovery on these sliders. There's other things that I can do, but th this is the simplest and most fun, is just ask for 15%. It's created a scenario, lightning fast. Now the first thing I need to do is, is get Daryl unnecessarily excited about this potential for recovery. So you're not, Daryl, you're not on track yet, okay? There's potential. It's pretty close. I hope you've got some management reserve, contingency, or whatever, because it's going to cost some money to get from here to here. But one thing that Acumen's going to help us do is help us spend the least amount of money possible. Well, and I would, so the way I would I submit do, without looking at it that it's going to be cheaper to try to accelerate that than it is to extend the whole project team out seven or eight additional months. Yes, you got it. You got it. And our reputation is going to be a lot better, too, if we can deliver on time as well. Um, Daryl, I, I see some opportunity here, and I see some concerns, and I'm going to try to wrap this up in just a minute here. One, Acumen is telling us to spend more money on procurement to shorten the delays due to procurement. So that's for one. Number two, it's suggesting that we accelerate the do uh, some of the domestic, um, I think this is manufacturing. Yes. Uh, functions. Now, some of that has risk, but then some of that 
is just going to be compensating for risk that we have in construction. Now, what I'm most nervous about, and I don't think we should do, is try to accelerate construction. I've seen that attempted before. There's quality and safety concerns, and we're not going to we're not going to decide to do that as a team. It's nice that Acumen made that suggestion, but what we're going to do is we're going to try to spend on these first two, continue to mitigate construction risk, but not try to win the day by cutting 43 day construction timeframes on things like site establishment down to 22 days. There's going to be problems if we try to do that that are going to ripple through. So quality issues are going to disqualify construction. That's something you and I know how to disqualify. Acumen doesn't yet. We could teach it to. We could say construction's a no-go and it'll run this again. But we're going to focus for the time being, we're going to focus on these two disciplines. I know it works with procurement. Those vendors, you offer them more, all of a sudden that stuff shows up overnight. FedEx, hand delivered, white glove, you know. So maybe that's what's called for. Then maybe we just do these and we see how the schedule calculates. The takeaway here, Daryl, is we're generating some ideas and Acumen's helping us guide, helping guide us. I have one last parting thought for me before I, I turn it to you all, and then we got to show you some upcoming events too. Um, export. You can take the risk delayed schedule, you can take the optimized schedule, and you can export it back to the scheduling tool that you started with, or you can actually con can convert and kind of crisscross them as well. It, you, the, in our early days, this was an open loop process. You just went in here to discover, you couldn't publish back. Now it's a closed loop process. You can diagnose, risk adjust, export it back to your schedule, and maybe win, like we talked about in the title. Daryl, your thoughts and any questions that have come in, and I'm gonna to go to some of these parting <coughs> slides. Uh, I guess, I guess for me personally, um, the idea of having the risk tool included with the other acumen tools, uh, specifically forensics and and the fuse functions, I'm able to actually do all of this actually in the tool and not have to run back and forth between my scheduling tool and the diagnostic tool, back and forth multiple times to get what I want. Uh, before I actually do the risk, I can actually do it all in Acumen. Um, again, it's a that's a great it's, point. It's, it's, One it's piece a, of software. Yeah, it's a standalone file. It's not. I'm not corrupting or even modifying the original file. Um, in fact, Acumen won't let you modify the original file you brought in. It'll make a copy of it before you can touch it. Um, yep, it's a sandbox until you willfully decide that it's no longer a sandbox. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, just for the sake of time, um, Daryl and I are both going to be appearing uh, virtually, but you'll actually see us on camera if you join this event here. Um, it's preparing for the next generation of PPM, uh, 11 to 5 Eastern, coming up on April 10th. I think it starts a little bit earlier than that, but the way to find out is just Google. We could have put a, we've got a link in here, but you, it's not clickable. So you Google Dell Tech Seminars. And it starts at April 4th, and you just scroll down three or four items to April 10th, and you'll see this preparing for the next generation of PPM. We'll be talking risk. Daryl's going to be talking schedule diagnostics, and getting the schedule up to a certain level of quality before you um, before you even begin doing risk. A couple upcoming events that uh, DR McNatty will be at. Maybe Dell Tech's going to show up at a couple of these as well. Collaborate uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, the AAC International Conference and Expo, June 24th, 27th in San Diego. Couldn't we pick better places to go? I know, that's great. It's like a dream come true. <laughs> and uh, Daryl, you all have this monthly newsletter where you can sign up to be in the loop, drmcnatty.com slash news. Yep. All right, Daryl, you're a good sport today. We kind of had to hurry up a little bit towards the end, but we were able to actually get everything done in the software uh, that we needed to. The briefing, the optimization, we we, we, sh we showed everybody what it's all about. Um, Daryl, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me on your uh, your monthly technical webinar. Thanks, Tom. And it's uh, top, yeah, thanks. top of the hour. Let's turn it back over to Dan for any final, uh, final comments. All right, Tom, Daryl, thank you very much. It was a very good presentation. I enjoyed it myself. Hopefully our audience did. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, taking some time out of your day and being with us. 
Uh, just a reminder, we are going to put together a follow-up email. And uh, Tom, if there is a white paper based on that question, uh, maybe you could forward that to us. We can include that as part of our follow-up email to go out to everybody. Oh, brilliant idea. Brilliant. Yeah, we'll send that white paper out along with uh, the Q&A that came in, a link to the recording of the webinar, and the presentation from Daryl and Tom today. Uh, again, we appreciate everybody's time, and we look forward to uh, you joining us for future technical webinars.